So the, the name of this talk is Just Enough Functional Programming to Be a Danger to Yourself and Coworkers. And a uh, short story, since I'm condensing a 30-minute talk down to about 10 minutes, right? But short story, uh, don't introduce functional programming co uh, concepts the first week on a new job. You will freak out your, uh, your coworkers. They'll be like, what the heck is this? No, and they will reject your PR immediately. Just saying. That's, that's kind of how this got inspired. Um, who am I? Uh, I'm Kyle Shevlin, as it was mentioned before. Uh, everyone needs to have my Twitter handle, of course. I'm pretty prolific on there, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your uh, perspective. I'm a senior software engineer at Fastly, as I said, a lover of JavaScript, hater of semicolons, and maintainer of this glorious beard. And uh, I also uh, host a new podcast that I'm going to plug right here called Second Career Devs. Uh, some of you who know me know that I was a pastor uh, before I became a software engineer. And uh, I'm just trying to find great stories out there and share them uh, with, with the world. And if you have great stories, let me know. Um, today we're going to cover some uh, functional programming techniques because you've probably heard it's all the it's all the rage right now in JavaScript especially, and um, I want to give you uh, just enough that you can actually start to delve into functional programming, and you can dry up your code bases, you can make them more easy to reason about, and and hopefully be able to write um, code that's more easily tested and uh, just makes more sense. You'll start to understand as we go through this. Um, but we need to cover four topics to be able to do the basics. And those topics are higher order functions, purity, currying and partial application. I promise you currying is the most FP vernacular word there is in here. You will not be scared by functors and monads and applicatives and that kind of thing. And then uh, composition. So. Uh, but before we get into that, like some of you might not know what functional programming is. And so I thought it would be important to kind of define it, but functional programming is a bit of a pain in the ass to define, it turns out. Um, because the formal definition is something like this. It's a style of building the structure and elements of computer programs that treats computation as the evaluation of mathematical functions. Who's bored right now just reading that? Right? That's a, that's a, it's a technically correct definition, but it doesn't really tell you much, right? It's unfortunately like just very not helpful, and it's like it, this is the metaphor I decided to come up with. It's not that different from telling you that the definition of painting is to apply paint to a surface, because we can't define it based on a couple words. What we actually can see is functional programming is easier to see. It's easier to read than it is to define. So we're going to define it by the characteristics that differentiate it. So like with painting. Like, pointillism is something we can easily define, right? We can define it as art comprised of points. And then impressionism, we can tell it's different than pointillism uh, based on this is broad brush strokes, uh, brush strokes. this isn't very detailed. Um, we can tell the difference by sight, and we can do the same thing with uh, functional programming and our code. Functional programming prefers these things called expressions versus statements. Uh, it avoids mutations. It avoids side effects, and its logic is built through composing pure functions, which I will teach you what a pure function is uh, ev eventually. So this is some imperative code that you're seeing on the screen right now. Uh, imperative code means that we write code such that we instruct the program or the computer what to do line by line by line. In here, we create an empty array, and we run a for loop. If you learn functional programming, you will never have to write a for loop again in your life. You will never have a global uh, like I on the, the let line. Like If you forget let, and now you have a global I sitting around, and you've had that bug. Um, I hear a few laughs. I, I, some people have had that bug before. But you'll never have that again in functional programming. But we run a for loop, and we push every result into the, the results array. And apparently, I have a typo there, so this program wouldn't work. Um, and then we return it. But that's imperative. You see how on each line of the code, we tell it what to do. You've probably heard this fancy word declarative, right? Where like we declare what result we want from a program, and we just let someone else deal with the implementation details, right? Someone out there wrote the map method on arrays, and somehow it magically takes this function, and it gives us back a new array, right? This is declarative programming, and functional is a type of declarative programming. So you see here, we have the same function. We give it an array, and we return the values one at a time multiplied by two. Functional would kind of look like this. We would have a couple functions. We would have a double function that takes a value and returns its double. 
we would have a map function which takes a function and then returns a new function that takes an array. That's, that's a key there, it returns a new function. Uh, returns an array and then we run our map over it. And so making that double each function is the composition of passing double into map and then an array into that composed function. I know I just said a whole bunch of words, let me teach you them. So let's start with higher order functions. This actually makes up a lot of JavaScript and you're probably doing this all the time without maybe necessarily thinking about the fact that you're using higher order functions. A higher order function just has to uh, obey one of these two or both of these laws. It accepts a function as an argument or it returns a new function. So imagine having built uh, like an add function, right, that takes an x and a y and returns their summation. So a higher order function means I can actually pass add functions into add functions, into add functions, into add functions. It just, it can keep going down the stack. And JavaScript allows us to do this. This is actually pretty awesome. But in order to make the most use of this, we want to make sure that our functions are pure. Um, this is where bugs fall in your code all the time, is when you write impure functions. A pure function is one that gives the same inputs and will always return the same output without any side effects every time. So that add function I was telling you about, right? We take an x and a y and we return an x and a y. And you're like, Kyle, that's really boring. But how many times have you seen what seems to be a really simple function in your code and somehow you have a mutation, like on the impure example? Uh, you're walking through a, a pull request and someone has decided that they need to mutate some states somewhere else or maybe they're trying to do like four things in the same function, right? Pure functions come down to something really simple and really easily tested. Like if you had this add function, you would know immediately how to write a test for it. You'd give it some data and you'd expect the, the data out. It would always be the same. We need pure functions in order to do functional programming. And, and, pure, and true functional programming languages like Haskell or uh, some of the front end languages that are coming out these days such as Elm and Reason, like they will push you to use this all the time. You'll write everything in pure functions. Um, purity leads to easily testable functionality, as I suggested, but it also does this thing where it creates these trustworthy contracts between our functions. And that's a fact that we can uh, utilize throughout our application. And that leads us to the, what I call like the meat of, and potatoes of functional programming and like getting into it. It's currying and partial application. And I literally mean meat and potatoes to some degree. Uh, um, I love uh, yellow curry. Anyone else a fan of curry here? Um, so I'm talking about this guy, Haskell Brooks Curry. He's a super smart dude, and I'm not talking about the food, which is super delicious food, right? Um, Haskell Brooks Curry was this genius who, um, his, his claim to fame is what's called combinatory logic and advancing uh, mathematical logic in that way. I won't get into that. I don't have time for it. Uh, but his name is so important that it's become three different programming languages, including the most popular one you probably know is Haskell. But this technique was named after his name too. And currying is the technique of refactoring a function that normally accepts multiple arguments into one that accepts them one at a time. So the canonical, the canonical curried function that you'll, everyone learns the first time is the add function. That's why I've been talking about it. So add normally would take an x and a y. But if we make it a curried function, we're gonna use a higher order function. See, I brought that word back. And we return a new function that waits for its second parameter, right? You, you catching that? So we get the x, we return a function that waits for the y. When we get the y, it finally evaluates. It doesn't evaluate beforehand. And then if you're already using ES6, uh, you get to use arrow functions to write these, and it's really elegant. You just, you become really good at writing uh, argument returns argument returns argument returns argument and writing out your curried functions. So why was that useful? Well, it's useful because we can partially apply values to these functions and store them in closure. Um, closure is like that classic JavaScript interview question, right, that all of us kind of stumble through. But in this case, what it really means is that a value is kind of held in state in the function, right? And we're waiting for the last value to finally use that, that state and return our output. So as you can see on my example here, I have uh, our add function bef from before, and I give it its first value, that x. I give it a 5, and now I've created a new function. 
I've created an add five function that I can continue to reuse again and again and again throughout my application and just keep logging out or keep adding new numbers to it. And I always get a new uh, summation. So currying is like really powerful, but you also have to understand that the argument order in which you supply arguments to your curried functions really matters. Um, and the general rule of thumb, as I like to describe it to people, is you want the most unstable argument to be passed last. How many of you are familiar with using array.map or array.filter or array.reduce? Go ahead and, okay, so most of you are pretty familiar with that. If, uh, if you have, how many have used it with Lodash, like the regular Lodash, right? Like, and, and in the regular Lodash, what do you do? You supply the array first and then you supply the callback function. Or if you're writing it with the native method, you have an array and you dot it with the callback function. But that kind of isn't the most useful order of functionality, right? Because I might reuse that function, that callback, again and again and again, but I might want to call it a many different arrays. This is what functional programming and currying does. We flip the order. So rather than having an array and feeding it the callback, we have a callback and we wait to give it an array. Does that make sense? So in this case, I've made a new filter function that's actually a curried version. And what I do is the first argument it gets is the callback function. And then it returns a new function and it's waiting for the array. So I make a filter, I give it that callback function. That's less than 10 is now a new function. And I have multiple arrays and I can use the same filter and supply it the arrays over and over and over again. What you can start to see is that like functional programming is a really useful way to build up complex logic for manipulating data. And as you grow in your JavaScript or your front end careers, that's most of what we do. We take data in, we just get JSON dumps all the time. We take data in and we spit data out back on the page. And so I think that's really where the power of this starts to come in is when we start to realize how we can uh, compose and make these reusable functions throughout our application, which brings us to composition. Now I promise you, this is probably the worst, the most boring part of it because it's going to bring you back to high school and if you're like me, you dread high school and you hated it so much and you don't want to think about anything you learned or did then. Uh, maybe a few of you actually loved high school, I don't know. Um, but uh, I want you to think back, and not to the shitty parts, uh, but to the math parts, which might have been shitty parts, I apologize. Um, but do you remember this? You remember doing some math and you had an equation like f of x equals y? Anyone remember that? Okay, so in math, all functions are pure functions, right? They always give you one output for the input that you give. That's kind of nice, unlike our programs at work where like I call a function and eight things happen and I don't know why it's doing that and now I have to spend an hour and a half banging my head against a wall trying to solve a problem, right? Um, math gives us pure functions. Functional programming demands we use pure functions. So as we said before though, we can give functions a function as an argument. And that's what composition is. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, f of g of x equals y is a composition of a g function and fed into an f function. So in programming, we rarely name functions a single letter, okay? If you do, stop. Uh, just don't do it. That, I feel bad for your teammates if you write functions that only have a single letter. Um, but nesting functions can be really, really ugly. Um, and so I have this example here. I've made three curried functions at the top. Um, they only take one argument, so I didn't really have to curry much, right? But they all take a string, and they return something. Uh, the first one's a scream, the second one is an exclaim, and the third one's a repeat, and then I supply it a string, right? And so what I get is I can create this, uh, this um, result by composing these functions together, where I first scream at Bob, and then I exclaim at Bob, and then I repeat it at Bob, and if there's anyone named Bob here, I'm really sorry. Um, but we yell at Bob twice that the world is coming to an end, right? But that could be really ugly, especially if you have really long, clear function names, right? If you're following clean code principles, you might be like, if this does X, blah, 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 and you have a 40 character function name, imagine trying to like compose those. That, you're, uh, that would be a nightmare to try and read. So there's a great other way to do it. Instead of nesting functions, what if we use that Excuse me, what if we use that currying and partial application that we learned to create new functions for us that would do the composition for us? And so I'm going to introduce you what's called the compose function. And if you get into this, you're going to be using compose all the time. It's a little hard to read sometimes the first time, so I want to walk you through it. Um, 
Compose is a function that takes any number of functions as arguments, any number. And it, uh, it, it creates an array out of them. We're using the, the rest parameter, if you're familiar with ES6. And then it, it returns a new function that's waiting a value. In this case, I called it x. And what it does is it runs, uh, it does a reduce, but a reduce right. So we're going to start at the end of the array, and we're going to work our way to the front. And the reason we do that rather than from left to right is it's more mathematical. We want to work from the inside of our function out rather than some weird outside in composition. Um, but we take the last function, we supply it our starting value, and that gets passed as the accumulator, and we return the value that's derived from firing that function with that value. And then it's fed into the next one, and it's fed into the next one, and it's fed into the next one. You following me? And eventually we get our, our end result. So that's compose. If you ever come across the functions pipe or flow, that's the opposite. It's the same function but going in the other order. Just want to make you aware in case you do. So we can take this compose function, and I've, I've already walked through all this apparently. The compose function takes a blah, 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 blah. <laughs> all right, so let's take that, that, those, um, those functions that we made to yell at Bob before, and let's make a much easier to read function that uh, can, can be reused throughout our application. In this case, we're gonna pretend we've imported all those functions, and we create a new function worn adamantly where we compose, scream, exclaim, repeat. And yes, I read that from bottom up, because as I said, composition is from right to left. So that's one thing you want to get in your brain, is that it's from right to left. So we're first going to scream, then we're going to exclaim, and then we're going to repeat. And then we supply it its string, and we have a much easier to read line where const warn bob equals warn adamantly our string, right? Anyone, ag everyone agree that's much easier to read than all the nested versions? So. That is composition. What you end up doing in your applications is you end up creating uh, a bunch of functions that are really simple to reason about, and then you build up bigger and greater complexity by composing and combining them and reusing them. And you could see how this is really useful with array manipulation or object manipulation. And so um, I don't have time in a short talk to do any like live coding or show you how, so I made a repo that has some functional programming exercises that you are welcome to go try. I heavily borrowed them from the Mostly Adequate Guide to Functional Programming. Um, I made them uh, slightly different and a little easier. Um, but that is a great uh, uh, book that can introduce you to functional programming in JavaScript, and I actually have it here in my resources. So I recommend The Mostly Adequate Guide to Functional Programming by Professor Frisbee or Dr. Boolean or AKA Brian Lonsdorf. He has so many uh, aliases on the internet, I don't know why. Um, he also has a really great Egghead I.O. course, which I recommend to people. If you want to start trying this out in your own projects, I recommend these two libraries, Ramda or Lodash FP. And uh, they provide you with all these utility functions you're used to, but the arguments have been or, uh, switched to be more functional. And it has a, a curried function, so you can start to auto-curry all these functions and get used to using that. And then uh, also, I recommend the YouTube channel Fun Fun Function. He has a number of uh, functional programming uh, tips, as many as many others. He's very hilarious. Um, one that's probably the, the quintessential one to watch is one called Composition versus Inheritance, where you get to learn how to make a murder robot dog. And that's really nice. And then uh, lastly, there was a really great uh, video that came out a couple weeks ago about the fundamentals of lambda calculus, which is actually the logic and mathematics that kind of uh, make this all possible. And if you think this is all weird, like there was a Twitter thread today where uh, it was discussed that both like World War II, uh, uh, some of its results are dependent upon functional programming. Turing machines are equivalent to lambda calculus, and if you've seen the imitation game, right? Like, or um, you know, NASA uses functional programming to send people to planets and satellites and all that stuff. So I encourage you to learn it. Uh, I encourage you to come up to me and ask me any questions or follow me on Twitter, and my DMs are always open. So thank you very much.